Greetings, everyone. Welcome to session 36 in our uh, series on what's a library if the building is closed. As, as many of you would know, we started this in March uh, as a response to Hi. that question and that circumstance. Um, uh, it, you know, it kind of started out as uh, libraries in reaction. We were all going, hey, what, what is this? And then as we came to understand the, uh, the scope of this pandemic, uh, uh, this morphed into libraries in response, what kind of actions we could take in dealing and coping with this uh, global tragedy. And then now into what we're calling libraries in recovery. So we're thinking, all right, we're coming out of this some way, so to some extent, what's, what's the new environment gonna look like and, and what, are, what are libraries going to be doing differently than they did before the pandemic? Um, and so we've had, uh, we've had now 90 speakers in the series and some 4,000 people register and on we go. Um, we are the Gibbet Libraries Network. My name's Don Means. Uh, we're the producer here. Our partner in the series uh, is the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA.org, uh, out of the Netherlands. Uh, IFLA is the global membership organization for national libraries and national libraries associations representing some 400,000 libraries around the world. <laughs> who in the context of the global pandemic, we think uh, represent a, a, a body of institutions an actual, perhaps even a physical network in response. And so uh, we've been working with IFLA and the Internet Society and a number of others to try to mobilize libraries in response. And uh, this is part of that. And there are other things going on. Uh, Steven Weiber, the head of public policy for IFLA is at the controls in in Holland as we meet right now. Our session sponsor is the Internet Society DC, DC chapter. Uh, they're doing some really interesting stuff with uh, community networks and uh, we'll have them on, I think next Friday to give us a, a briefing. Uh, our series sponsor is Adaptrum. It's the TV white space equipment maker that's been involved in a number of the projects that we've touched on here in the series. Uh, so today we have um, some outstanding speakers, uh, people that I've known for a long time, <laughs> know well and admire tremendously. Uh, Joe Sawaski, uh, the president and CEO of, of Merit Network, uh, the oldest or certainly uh, one of the leading Wrens in the United States. And, and Charlotte Brewersdorf will be with him, I think. I hope Charlotte's going to make it, uh, the VP for Community Engagement. We also have Jen Leisure, the CEO of The Quilt, which is the national organization of Wrens. And Jen will be giving us a, a story. They just had a, a, their national conference, and so there's, there's news galore, uh, we expect. But first, uh, we'll return to the, to the COVID report. Uh, it's just the backdrop for this whole thing. So we, we kind of check in on what's you know, happening, and you know the news is better and, and also worse. Um, this is a graph from two months ago when uh, things were just going nuts. Uh, we, were, we were looking at these graphs, you know, in the spring and those, those numbers were just kind of frightening. And then, and then in the summer we were hitting 60,000 cases and we were going, oh, wow. And then it kind of, you know, had that sort of fall decline and then it started this uh, hockey stick up and, and this was you know, uh, I, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with these numbers, but it's just fascinating to look at it in, in history. And, and, and they were, this wasn't even the peak uh, a month ago in January, uh, you know, nearly 300,000 cases in a day and over 4,000 people coming to the, and, and 132,000 people uh, hospitalized right near the capacity, total capacity of hospital IC units in the country, and, and many of them were, were over, over the top. Since then, we've seen this dramatic drop. So I guess after the holidays, uh, finally enough people were experiencing 
either firsthand the pandemic or knew somebody and it just looks like people settled down a little bit and stopped being so crazy about uh, exposing themselves. So this is a very promising trend uh, and, and definitely we have to take it as good news. So vaccines, you know, good, very good. Variants, not so good. So I think the upshot of this is that we're, we're in for this for the long haul because there's one, these variants are a, a byproduct of, a, of so many cases and uh, reinfections and that's what they do. They mutate and it's just normal. But with so many people in so many places having it, that creates a huge bed, a huge population of uh, mutant laboratories, if we can say that. So, and vaccinations, even if we could vaccinate everybody, it, it would take too long to actually do it. So the outlook I think that we're hearing is that even as our immunity kind of grows generally, this will be sort of endemic to our environment going forward. And I would expect it will be, you know, not as close and kissy kissy as we, as we've been in the past. So uh, at least it'll be better. Okay. I wanted to touch on this uh, uh, as, as part of, part of the introduction here, because it's something that uh, we think is important. This is a, uh, an FCC uh, docket talking about this emergency use of E-rate to uh, fulfill basically the purpose of E-rate, which is to provide connectivity support for libraries and schools. Uh, there's a petition right now, and it's a very popular one. There's, there's support up and down the line to uh, extend connectivity to the school learners, the students. Um, the FCC, the prior FCC seemed to confuse school buildings with actual schools, which are communities of learners and wherever they are. So there's no point in connecting a school building if there's nobody in it. And that's what this I think is about trying to address. We think it's an excellent idea uh, to use those resources uh, to reach the students where they are. And as a, uh, as a companion uh, notion to that, as ever with E-rate, it's always kind of schools and libraries. It's like libraries are a suffix of schools. They're just kind of thrown on as sort of an app. Well, don't forget the libraries, you know. Well, our case is that libraries are not schools. They're essential to good schools and learning in general, but they're a different institution. You know, they're local, almost entirely locally funded. They can do pretty much anything their communities want them to do, uh, unlike schools. And they're, they're critical to and so many services, connectivity being one, where one in three adults before the pandemic access the internet at a public library. That's a phenomenal number of 80 million people. That's like 14 and over. So we, we're planning to file here a comment uh, about this. There's a filing by the Schools Health and Libraries Broadband Coalition advocating for connectivity to students. We think that's all great, but we also want the FCC to make explicit inclusion of libraries to also be able to extend signal and connectivity beyond the walls to what we're calling service outlets or access stations in the, in the community, in neighborhoods. The, as we've talked about before, there should be a, a, a neighborhood access, a neighborhood library access station in every neighborhood. Should be within the easy reach of everyone. So, uh, these should be thought of as some kind of combination of a public phone and, a, and a, an emergency call box and uh, e-government kiosk and a, and a library access point. You know, a, a really important uh, capability, either as a primary connection, sadly for many, but as a backup connection for any kind of circumstances, uh, personal or general kind of outages. Uh, this is a general, we've shown this, this is a kind of a mock-up of a library extending wireless signals out to remote locations around. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a graph from the Nebraska project that we supported that shoots a five gigahertz signal uh, from the school in the upper right, four miles away to the little town of Plymouth, Nebraska, uh, to a water tower. And then the signal is spread to four library locations around the town. And you can see this little town, which is kind of typical for rural communities where we see the county density is very low, but most people kind of live close together in these small towns. 
which make them, we would say, ideal for certain mesh, work, mesh uh, networking solutions. Um, here's a, 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 an example of in, in Kansas. This is a, a playground that has a library access point. This is a physical presence for the library. And, and, and the access is to the library server, not just kind of the, well, you can do it any way you want to, but we would say that it's an ideal opportunity to connect directly to the library digital services. Uh, here's one that was a nomadic node, a prototype. Here's in Georgia, they're, they're repurposing old phone booths to be these kind of stations. One uh, project in, in Huron uh, move there is to support a early uh, COVID testing spot, you know, pop up. Uh, and they could even be, you know, populated by librarians. They could go out in these neighborhoods, you know, meet people, see what they, what they need and can help them. I mean, it's, it's the whole idea of inside out, right? We're seeing all the restaurants go outside. Well, the library is also going outside, but they're just going into the parking lot so far. But yet there are opportunities to go farther into the community and reach people closer to where they are with services with this core function, which is library Wi-Fi. Uh, and that's distinct from just public Wi-Fi. So uh, I am going to run, I'm going to run through, through quickly a, uh, a wireless primer to set up our presentation here. Um, if you'll bear with me, this is uh, uh, a, uh, let me copy that link. This is a, uh, uh, a resource that Scenic has put together. I'll put it in the chat later. And uh, and uh, so well, I'll just go with that right now because we're going to run. We want to run through this. Uh, this touches on various wireless technologies that we've we've done uh, presentations on on all of these in the past. Uh, the uh, wireless as a, as either a primary connection or a secondary connection. We all want fiber, right? We all want fiber to my house, to my living room, wherever, but it's just not there. It's not really close to there in most places. Uh, 5G is, you know, everybody's kind of flavor du jour, but eh, it's effectively, in our view, it is a plan to use very, very uh, high frequency spectrum, millimeter wave spectrum in dense areas where you have to have a, a, a transmitter every, every few hundred feet. And that's just not gonna work in rural environments. And when they say they have 5G, they're talking about not uh, high band, they're talking about mid band and low band frequencies, which we already have effectively. LTE, I think we're gonna hear a little bit about that today. This is what we use normally for our uh, phones. Uh, fixed wireless is, is a different kind of thing. The licensing are different where we can do line of sight or in some cases where we have certain kind of frequencies we can uh, do non line of sight. Uh, this, is, this is just a helpful uh, primer on, on understanding spectrum and frequencies and you know, different kinds of uh, Here's a, a great mesh uh, graph uh, to understand uh, pros and cons. You know, there's some difficulties, uh, of course, with any technology. Uh, here's a, in the lower right here, that's a TV white space example where the signal can go actually over uh, uh, hills. Uh, it's special advantages. It it's, doesn't require line of sight where most do. Uh, most antennas have to see each other uh, like or, you know, like with Wi-Fi, you know, one wall and, and you're dead. So there are pros and cons of all of these. Don, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Are you, um, have you been advancing slides in your slide deck? We are still looking at your title slide. Oh yeah, well, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Jen. Thank you very yeah, much. Interruption, yep. Okay. Okay, then. How about that? You see that? You see still, broadband radio? Don, uh, I think it, when no. you share your screen, I think you may need to check that you're sharing the screen where the link is opening up because you're still okay. on the wireless technology scenic report. All right. That's slide. okay. I, I just wanted to highlight this. 
uh, I'll, I'll put the link in the chat. Uh, it'll be, uh, it'll be part of the, the, uh, it's on, it was on that slide I showed the link there. So it'll be accessible, uh, by anyone looking at the video. Uh, but it's just a resource we think is valuable for, um, anybody that's exploring wireless. And we suggest that every, every library has some opportunity to work with wireless. You know, you've already done Wi-Fi, uh, you've turned Wi-Fi out the window to the parking lot. So keep going. How far can you take this, this service? And if the FCC is uh, compliant, which I think they will be, uh, you may have even not only permission, but you may also have possible subsidies to do that kind of thing. So I'll close there with that. Uh, uh, overview and background. And now happily, I will uh, turn it over to Jen Leisure of the Quilt to tell us what's happening nationwide with the research and education networks, who, by the way, are the, the original builders of the internet. Once it was kind of hatched in the lab, it was the universities that really built it, but the universities themselves didn't really want to do network building. So they created these, these nonprofits, these RENs, to uh, do the, the build out for them. And they've evolved since then to be key players in connecting anchor institutions around the country. Jen, welcome and good to have you for the first time. Uh, and uh, please take us away. Oh, thanks, Don. Uh, thanks so much for having me today. It's nice to be with all of you. And Don, thanks for the, the great background uh, on the history of the r &E networks. Uh, you can tell that you've been a, a close colleague and good friend of the community for a long time, being able to tell our story there uh, so well. Um, it's so great to also see many of our quilt members uh, here on the call. Um, certainly, you know, we've got Merritt here, they'll be presenting, uh, but I see representatives from Kimber in Pennsylvania, MCNC in North Carolina, so uh, nice to see all of you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully it all works all right. Better than mine, I'm sure. <laughs> well, we'll see. We will see. Um, first of all, I'm just going to give a, a very brief in introduction. I'll try to keep things. There we go. I'll try to keep things quick here. I feel like the the warm up band a little bit because you know Merritt here, the real stars of the show and the work that they're doing um, in the state of Michigan. Um, as an introduction to the quilt, I oftentimes get asked what the quilt stands for, what the acronym is that the quilt stands for. So I wanted to put this up here as a little bit of a background, um, really in the roots of where the, the quilt comes from um, as a collaboration of the U.S. Research and Education Networks, the, the statewide r &E networks you'll hear, our, uh, hear us refer to ourselves as. Um, but we are a, a patchwork of these networks uh, across the country. Um, working together um, to stitch together so the whole cloth is substantially more useful and valuable than the, the sum of the parts. And that's really the spirit of collaboration that we have uh, with the 40 plus um, statewide networks that are part of the quilt. So just to, to give you an idea here, um, r &E networks connect tens of thousands of community anchor institutions uh, across the country. Our roots, as Don mentioned earlier, are in higher education. Uh, but since, uh, since the days of the National Science Foundation, the first NSF nets, um, these universities uh, that founded these r &E networks have expanded their missions uh, to serve other uh, types of community anchor institutions. This gives you a sense of uh, the whole cloth that we talked about uh, for, uh, for the quilt. Uh, this gives you a sense of our members statewide networking infrastructure, uh, as well as how they interconnect with one another. Um, there's another layer here that I didn't put in, but we're also uh, all connected into the National Research and Education Network Backbone Internet too. Um, so they're an important partner of ours as well, but I wanted to give this audience a sense of that, that statewide reach. Um, this is really the, the middle mile networks that you're seeing here. Uh, it's too much to put in the last mile connections out to all those tens of thousands of community anchor institutions uh, that these networks connect. Uh, I mentioned earlier about the, the different types of communities that are served by the research and education network. So this gives you a flavor of all those different communities. We're gonna narrow in on the public libraries and the partnerships that the r &E networks have had uh, for, uh, uh, for a long time with public libraries throughout the US. 
Uh, I'm going to narrow in here on just a few examples. There's a number of our quilt member organizations that uh, have a long history of partnering uh, with, with the public libraries. Uh, Don, you talked about Scenic and their, their wireless uh, overview uh, that they have, but Scenic, you know, has a, a really large um, uh, effort with the, all the public libraries in the state of California. I think they connect uh, over a thousand of them uh, and the majority of them uh, being one gigabit uh, connections. Um, I think Scenic was also the, uh, the helped the first library in the US to have a 10 gigabit connection. Uh, that's in uh, one of the public libraries in Los Angeles several years ago. Um, so they've also been at the forefront among with many of our other members. You'll hear from Merit here um, shortly. Uh, so I just pulled out a, a few examples that I'm gonna share with you. The, the types of services that the, the libraries provide, um, they were actually captured, in fact, by a, um, by a report that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation commissioned about 10 years ago, uh, a study that, um, that researched the value of research and education networks to support public libraries. Uh, so, you know, also recognizing through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation public library program um, that they had at the time, um, recognizing what important partners these organizations are. Um, the RE networks or RENs provide e rate assistance. Um, uh, the RENs operate uh, either as consortium filers within the e rate program for schools and public libraries or as service providers, um, providing connectivity. Uh, high performance connectivity, resilient connectivity, um, which is, you know, very important in the, in the library world, content filtering, uh, technical support, cloud services, and online resources in the form of forms of databases, and other kind of shared resources there. Uh, I'm going to talk about just a few examples. There are so many um, that I can provide to you from the different states. Uh, so some examples here, um, OneNet, the r &E network in Oklahoma has been a trusted partner for, for decades to the public libraries and state, providing all the services that you see here on the left-hand side. Um, Learn, the r &E network in Texas uh, is currently working on a project uh, with their state librarian to bring uh, one gigabit connections to 31 of their rural libraries. Um, and this is an important piece of the work that the quilt members do. Uh, we do our work in, in partnership um, with you know, last mile providers. And so uh, LEARN is partnering uh, with rural telcos throughout the state of Texas um, to help bring those connections into those 31 libraries. Austin, I'm gonna tell the, the Kimber story here. Austin uh, Gamble's on from Kimber. Uh, but they were one of the first partners in the towards the gigabit library project um, that I'll talk about more here in a minute. Um, but there was also an exciting announcement I think was just last week uh, that the Kimber CEO Nathan Flood was appointed to the Pennsylvania Integrated Library Systems Board of Directors. So uh, again, just an example of how closely um, the r &E networks work with the libraries in their states. The Connecticut Education Network connects about 70% of the libraries in their state. Um, and using some of the CARES Act funding that came through the, came through the governor's office, through the, uh, the governor's emergency education um, uh, support funding, uh, they've been using um, funds from there to connect, uh, connecting communities with about 200 Wi-Fi access points, delivering those out through their libraries to the different communities there. Um, Network Maine uh, also uh, is an important partner with the public libraries in their state, um, serving about 85% or connecting about 85% of the libraries through the uh, Maine Library Network uh, managed, by the, managed by Network Maine. And again, providing uh, many of the services that you see listed here on the left. So these are just examples across you know, a number of states. It's hard to talk to all of them in a short amount of time. Um, but I'd be glad to talk with you more about libraries in your states and the irony networks in your states if you'd, uh, if you'd like to do that after the presentation today. Um, I am going to uh, talk here about that gigabits towards gigabit libraries initiative. I can't really talk about partnerships between the irony networks and libraries without mentioning this initiative. Um, this is a project of the US Research and Education Network Internet 2. Um, they have a grant from the IMLS um, for working with um, the statewide research and education networks to bring this toolkit uh, towards a gigabit library toolkit 
to uh, rural and small and tribal tribe, excuse me, tribal libraries in their states um, to help uh, improve and evolve library staff understanding and interaction with the library's broadband connection and services. And that uh, that grant was just recently extended through IMLS uh, continue, to continue that great work. So if I had to had to mention that here. Uh, Stephanie Stenberg, who is the director of the Community Anchor Program for Internet 2, uh, manages this initiative and she does a really great job with that. I'm going to shift in and talk about some exciting work that the ARNI networks are doing in the wireless space. Uh, and again, this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but I'm just going to share a few examples here with you. Um, first, the Utah Education and Telehealth Network is really leading the way uh, in many ways uh, in our community. Um, they have recently have worked through a deployment to about 40 of their K-12 school districts uh, with the CBRS, um, with CBRS equipment out there. Uh, hopefully, most of you are familiar with CBRS, uh, the, the private LTT, the FCC just released uh, this spectrum. Um, some of the licenses went out uh, for auction, uh, but they also made available, available uh, a number of bands that are available generally uh, for use um, that uh, all of us can use in, in various ways. And so UETN is really taking advantage of this new opportunity with their community there in Utah. So very exciting work being done there. Um, the deployment being funded by CARES Act funding that came to the state of Utah. They're also working on a project right now uh, with their state librarian's office to connect tribal libraries uh, in northern Utah uh, using wireless spectrum technology. And so that's just getting off the ground and we'll look forward to hearing more from them as that project progresses. Um, Ocean, our RE network in Rhode Island, um, they're working on a CBRS proof of concept to underserved urban communities. Um, to support remote learning. Again, also funded by CARES Act uh, coming through the state. Uh, Network Nebraska has a number of wireless initiatives going on right now um, using all sorts of the technology that all of you are familiar with. Uh, cellular hotspots, uh, they're working with TV white space, EBS, uh, low earth orbit satellite service. Um, but one of the uh, one of the initiatives I'd like to highlight for you is their work with the Nebraska India, uh, Indian Community College. That's one of the two TCUs that are in Nebraska serving about 250 students a year. They have about an average full-time enrollment of 150 students. And that uh, particular campus is leading educational broadband project to serve all of the K through 12 and community college students within the boundaries of the Omaha and Santee reservations. Um, so these reservations were successful in the recent uh, EBS uh, tribal licenses effort. Uh, and so through that spectrum, um, there were some base stations installed and are passing traffic with about 20 pilot families right now connecting to the network. Um, these base stations connect back through the community college, uh, which connects into Network Nebraska. Um, so a series of cascading partnerships and collaboration um, to bring connectivity to you know, the most uh, hardest to reach areas of that state. Uh, and let's see, I'd like to mention Kimber again. Uh, last November announced a historic collaboration effort between MetaMesh Wireless Communities, Carnegie Mellon <clears throat> University, University of Pittsburgh and Kimber. Uh, this collaborative effort was the first nonprofit wireless internet model uh, in the country. And it's looking to shrink the digital divide for Pittsburgh communities that are in need. Um, so again, you know, all in partnership and collaboration to help um, bridge the gap for these learners, especially um, out there in the communities. Uh, and lastly, I'm gonna mention uh, the Maryland Research and Education Network, um, looking to stand up a, a wide, uh, hopefully county by county type of CBRS network uh, in their state, but doing great work there to, to understand uh, what the benefits and value can be of this new spectrum that the FCC has made available. I'm going to leave it there um, and uh, ask that you know if you have any questions about RNE networks or different initiatives, please contact me afterwards. Thank you. Wonderful, Jen. Thank you so much. A quick question uh, on the the wireless extensions: Are these being provided by the RENs to end users? Or are they being provided to the anchor to the libraries as 
their service? Who, who's, whose service is it as it, as it were? Uh, well, so it's a mixture actually. Um, so depending on location and all of you know that geography is the, uh, is the tricky part. So it can be directly uh, as the service of the RENs uh, or it can be in partnership with a, a different last mile provider to connect back into the RENs. Um, oh. and into their network. So it's really a, a variety. We're, you know, we're um, technologists looking for any type of solutions that we can. And, and oftentimes it takes, um, it takes many partners to help get out to those unserved and underserved areas. So uh, we're very open. And I think that's one of the unique aspects of the r &E networks. Because of our nonprofit missions, we're uniquely positioned to work with different types of partners for these types of solutions. That's a great, uh, a great last point you make there that, uh, that the motivations and the business models of the RENs are very different from commercial interest uh, as nonprofits. They're not trying to optimize profit. Doesn't mean they don't have a bottom line, you know, of course, but that they're also uh, state chartered entities or groups of states and therefore have kind of a domestic, uh, you know, responsibility and dedication in their home states to uh, as we see a lot with kind of small uh, wireless operators, you know, there, there are a lot of nonprofits in local areas and they, they have a higher regard for, for their own communities than, uh, than they might find in San Antonio or a corporate network interest, uh, not to point out AT&T or anything, but uh, it's also really interesting that, that so much new innovation around wireless is happening. And of course, it's natural, it seems, that the RENs are taking this up uh, because this is a huge area. I mean, wireless is with us and it's going to be with us for a long time. And it's relatively new, right? I mean, there have been, you know, forever we've had TV broadcasts, but I'm talking about since the, since the arrival of the phone, we've had a complete uh, overhaul of our understanding of the spectrum environment. And so the RENs as laboratories for trying out different regimes and spectrum technologies, uh, it's just, we're really lucky to have you all. So thank you, Jen, and thank all your members for, for doing great work. Thank you, Don, I appreciate it. So let's, let's go to Joe and Merit Network and uh, Joe, as is a longtime colleague, we've done projects together, uh, and Merritt is is leading on so many fronts. Jen mentioned several of them, but uh, they're going to talk to us about uh, the Michigan Moonshot, uh, which is kind of an exciting uh, project. And and uh, Joe, you're up. All right. Well, thank you, Don, and, and thank you, Jen, for that great tee up. I hope everybody can hear me okay and see the screen. Yeah. The thumbs up there from Jen. Thank you very much. Well, again, my name is Joe Sawaski. I'm the president and CEO of Merit Network. I have with me uh, Vice President for Community Engagement, Charlotte Beaversdorf, and we're going to kind of tag team on this. And uh, I'd like to kick us off, but uh, I hope you can see that uh, this is not for show. I'm coming to you from the Charlevoix, Michigan Community Library. My home broadband in a rural area uh, is not great every day. And for important presentations like this, I certainly like to come to a place that's welcoming and reliable. So I live, Michiganders do this. So I live up here uh, in Charlevoix, Michigan. And our home office is down, if I can do the weatherman thing here, uh, down here. So I've been telecommuting for a long time. And the local library here is just a fantastic place. There's lots of community meetings. Um, town hall meetings. Uh, my wife and I really enjoy the Michigan author lecture series they used to have pre-pandemic. Uh, we learned about the history of Fago Pop, uh, the city of Detroit, um, uh, Coast Guard cutters, and it's really a fantastic place. And I, I come here as often as I can. So it's great to, uh, to speak with other uh, aficionados and proponents and professionals of libraries. So thank you for that. I'll go ahead and get my context here. So Jen really set up the story of RE Networks, and I won't talk a lot about that broadly, but here in Michigan, uh, Merit Network has a, a very simple mission. Uh, we're about connecting organizations and building community. And we have three pillars. Uh, we provide network and telecommunication services, security services, and community building services for our state, and especially for nonprofits, educational, healthcare, library, and governmental entities, uh, just to name a few. 
Uh, a little bit about the history of Merit. Merit is the longest running research and education network in the United States. We're one of the oldest technology companies in Michigan. Uh, we're an independent 501c3. We are not part of state government or the university system. So that helps keep us a little uh, agile, uh, nimble and uh, motivated uh, for sustainability. Um, a little factoid here that uh, some of you on the phone might not know is that Merit was uh, awarded uh, the opportunity in the mid 80s to early 90s to run this thing called the National Science Foundation Network. And that was the precursor to what you now know as the modern internet before it was commercialized and let out into the wild. So Merit and Michigan have a, a pretty key place in at least the operations and a bit of the research uh, related to that network. We did receive, uh, you know, looking at the, the middle of this continuum here, we received two federal BTOP awards back in 2010 and 2011, and it helped us uh, basically double the size of our network and helped us create a lot of our own physical infrastructure too. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment, but just some highlights about the history and lineage uh, of the organization. Um, we are governed by 12 of the 13 public universities in Michigan. It's a super constructive and supportive group of uh, vice presidents, usually CIOs uh, from the public universities in Michigan. I mentioned we're an independent nonprofit, 501c3. We serve uh, a bit over 400 anchor institutions in the state and uh, about 870 or so of their facilities uh, across the state as well. And I already talked about uh, our membership here. No merit presentation would be complete without showing our network. Our engineers love this slide. This is really just our core backbone network. We have lots of spurs and stars on the end of those spurs that reach into communities and anchor institutions. But essentially we've got over 4,000 miles of our infrastructure. Uh, unlike many r and &E networks in the United States, we own most of our networks. So we actually have a network operations center. We are watching for break, uh, break events. We're rolling trucks almost every night somewhere in Michigan, especially in the winter and during thunderstorms. Uh, we're fusing fiber and keeping that network running well for our, our membership. Interestingly, you can see we run through Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, into Ohio, and we connect with our peer organizations in those points. And uh, this just helps us have a, a nice resilient uh, core. And I know resiliency is an ongoing theme for uh, communities and broadly in Michigan, we can suffer a cut on any portion of this backbone and our users are unaware, uh, even though we are, as we roll trucks to fix things. Uh, we offer a lot of network services, layer one through three, essentially, uh, commodity internet service, which again, not every r &E network offers their communities. We connect people right to the internet over our infrastructure if they elect to do that. And you can see some of the other services we offer there as well, including DDoS protection uh, to keep members, uh, again, unaware of uh, nefarious activity that might be impacting them. Um, the story of the Michigan Moonshot kind of starts with my participation in former Michigan, Go Michigan Governor Rick Snyder's broadband task force in Michigan. Michigan had not had a broadband office uh, for forever, basically. And uh, Governor Snyder put together a, a broad uh, spectrum of constituents in the state. And I was asked to be on the working group for that to help uh, listen to the communities and make recommendations uh, to the state of Michigan. And, you know, current Governor Gretchen Whitmer has continued that work. Uh, her approach is evolving to that. Uh, she has uh, just uh, sort of reinvigorated uh, a state broadband office, and we're working really hard in Michigan and trying to be supportive of that effort. Um, but, you know, what was really heartbreaking to me in my participation on the governor's task force was, you know, Merit is a B2B organization. We serve anchor institutions, nonprofits. And we really hadn't been too involved in the challenge of connecting homes and residences uh, to the internet. That wasn't really part of our mission. But as I uh, listen to citizens and roadshows across the state talk about the plight of students and the elderly and community members and, and people seeking workforce development opportunities and training, it really broke my heart. And since at the time Michigan didn't have a broadband office, I came back to my really capable team at Merritt and I said, what can we do as a state r &E network to help this challenge? Um, and eventually when the state is ready to really, you know, ramp up fully a broadband office to complement uh, that effort and help propel them, give them a little head start. 
Uh, and here in Michigan, you can see some of the sad, uh, sad statistics. The one that really is the most heart-wrenching is that 27% of K-12 through students don't have access to broadband quality services in their home. And this was a study done a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic. Um, this was based on FCC Form 477 data, so you, I, you probably know that that story and I won't go into that, but this problem is probably understated by a factor of two to four, uh, we believe in the state of Michigan. And we think at Merit, we have a responsibility to help our citizens and educational constituents of develop solutions to making that situation better since so much information access and learning and teaching now happens in homes, especially with the flipped classroom uh, method of instruction. You can see the, uh, the FCC uh, uh, maps that were uh, created by Connect Michigan back in 2018. Again, we think this is pretty severely understated, uh, but any, any, uh, any color you see other than gray represents sort of a, a very bad story uh, for constituents in Michigan. So with that, we came back and, and Vice President Charlotte Beversdorf, who will take this presentation over in a moment, and I, uh, put our heads together with some of the rest of the team at Merritt. We said, what can we do here? And we launched this program called the Michigan Moonshot, which is, was again, taking Michigan out of its traditional comfort zone of uh, serving just anchor institutions. And we created this uh, initiative statewide to hopefully help create an ecosystem of community experts and public-private partnerships to you know, move, the, move the needle uh, in Michigan. You can see here, I've got a few partners listed. Uh, Michigan State University and the Coelho Center there have been just a phenomenal partner. And we'll talk about some of the good work that uh, those faculty researchers have helped us with and continue to help us with in Michigan. And then the Measurement Lab was a great nonprofit partner in helping us understand uh, how to use speed tests and integrate those into potentially statewide broadband surveys. And we have research scientists at Merit and again, collaborations with researchers at universities. And we're really excited about this open source, uh, citizen driven, uh, crowdsourced broadband uh, access initiative that MLab has. And we're leveraging that in several, several ways. So this Michigan Moonshot uh, initiative that we created has three basic pillars. Uh, data and mapping, which is sort of the start of any community journey to improve the situation for their residents. Funding and policy. We like to be able to help advise communities if they don't have the expertise to understand what opportunities might exist uh, with grant and subsidies to help vault their efforts forward, either in planning or actual implementation of networks. And then education and resources. We've done some really neat things, much like Don has done with this educational series for our state. We've had thousands of attendees over the last couple of years for that as we try to create more expertise in the state as communities begin to take that journey. So those are the three pillars, and I'm going to turn it over to Charlotte Beversdorf, who has been an absolute force and an expert uh, for merit and in the state of Michigan, and her reputation is uh, certainly growing within the state and even nationally as an expert here, and I'm uh, very proud to work with her, and I'm going to turn it over to her to talk about what is going on on the ground with this initiative. So Charlotte, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Joel, for the kind words, Don. Thank you for inviting us to join today. And um, Joe, I think you gave a really, really good tee up to exactly what Moonshot's about. It's a statewide call to action. And at its essence, it's really about building that ecosystem um, kind of up and through the stack. So local, state, federal, et cetera. Um, and to kind of give us a high level overview of, of the work we've been doing with Moonshot, um, I kind of categorize it by year of, of what stage we were in with building the initiative. So, so it as Joe mentioned, beginning in 2018, that was really a year of setting the foundation, identifying pillars of focus. And we chose these because these are really the areas that trip up local communities on making progress. Um, they create difficulties and loops where communities kind of stop and start pretty consistently early on in, in the broadband journey process. So that's why we're focusing here. And um, we have really worked hard to build an initiative that's, that's very action driven. Um, and very pragmatic and is all about communities taking those potentially small, potentially large, but um, always forward moving steps uh, to make progress in the journey and kind of move, move past these difficult obstacles. Um, so 2018 was a foundation year. Um, throughout 2019, it was really about branding our initiative and building the right relationships at, at again, uh, the state and the, the national level. Um, 
And 2020 has been obviously a pandemic year, it has put uh, our moonshot work right at the forefront of a lot of what Merit's doing. I'm happy we started when we did. I wish we would have started five years prior. We probably would have been more prepared to make even a bigger impact, but I am proud of the work that, that we've done over the past three years. And our focus in 2020 has really been all around local engagement. We are putting a tremendous amount of resource in talking to local communities, understanding where they're at uh, in the broadband journey, what's the maturity of, of their you know, broadband stakeholder groups, if there is even a stakeholder group formed yet. Um, and then depending on what we're finding there, we're obviously introducing them to all that we've built within the Moonshot portfolio in terms of resources, knowledge, people, that ecosystem. Um, so, I'm not gonna go through each and every one of these details. Um, a lot of what we'll talk about today is focused around our data and mapping. We've made a tremendous amount of progress uh, in that area over the past three years, but um, even more so over the past six months. Uh, and so we'll, we'll share those details in the coming slides. Um, in terms of the funding and policy, that's obviously a really active landscape. And uh, that's an area where we do, uh, through engagement, obviously provide a lot of advice to local communities, but we rely a lot on, on our, our national relationships. So John uh, produces a policy report uh, through the quilt each month that we rely heavily on, and we make sure that our community is kind of getting that digest of what's happening uh, with regard to policy federally um, each and every month through a, a bi-monthly newsletter. Um, and then same thing with, um, you know, some of the other groups that, that can actually impact policy. So we work closely with Shelby at the federal level to advocate for E-rate expansion and e easing of, uh, you know, current policies that may uh, inhibit broadband growth or restrict it. And then at the state level, we work with the Michigan Broadband Cooperative who, um, or, uh, and Alliance, and, and they do a lot of that work at the state level for us. So we're relying a lot, again, on, on ecosystem and partners. Uh, a, a major goal of our work is not to recreate the wheel and to use the resources that are around us. So we, uh, you know, we're not invest over-investing um, both in, in human resources and capital to build the program. So it's just been such a wonderful experience. We've built a really great community. Um, at all levels of, 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 as I mentioned, and um, really proud of the work that the team's doing. As Joe mentioned, in education and resources, we've, we've developed this community network uh, framework document, and that is like soup to nuts, everything you would want to know about building a community network through the plan, build, run, operate, and maintain life cycle. Um, soon we'll be adding secure to that life cycle, and we'll be releasing our community network security framework document, um, and that's all around securing the network once it's built. Um, so that's kind of an ongoing and uh, living document that we'll continue to refine as we go through, you know, through the maturity of the program. Um, I think an important thing about that is it's it's very um, it's very robust. It's it's a pretty in depth document, and it's great to read about and learn about the journey. But um, we've we again wanted to keep things focused on action. So we've created a, a supportive educational program that really is based on the the information that's in the framework. But we pick specific topics and uh, dive into those. Unfortunately, only through webinar at this time due to the pandemic. But um, we have plans to build a statewide roadshow, boot camp, and workshop series to kind of support uh, those theoretical concepts that are within our framework document. And then the last thing I'll mention in the resources category that's been um, very, very valuable to build is um, through our Merit Marketplace, which was an existing platform, um, we've, we've brought in service providers that basically fill every single um, need in that plan, build, run, operate life cycle. And so that is a, a nice platform and incubator for public-private partnerships. And it's been doing a good job, you know, to serve that purpose. I think most of the engagement we're seeing, um, communities maybe aren't ready for those services yet because they're pretty early in the broadband expansion planning uh, pieces of things. But we're, we're hopeful that that, that uh, platform continues to act as a, a, a landing page for communities when they uh, become ready to receive those services. So Joe, you can go ahead and click. I, I think we should jump into data. I want to be respectful of time. So um, our, our data collection work began, as Jill mentioned, um, in collaboration with Michigan State University's Quello Center and faculty researchers at MSU, as well as um, we're leveraging the measurement lab speed test. And this work began in 2018 with a set of joint comments to the NTIA. Um, 
in which we kind of spitballed this idea to leverage citizen scientists and a crowdsourcing technique to develop unbiased, granular, and accurate broadband access and adoption information. And that's a mouthful, but I say it probably 10 times a day, so I'm getting okay at it. Um, but, uh, you know, it was a novel concept. And not only did we, uh, you know, have interest in obviously the local approach and involving citizens, but the uh, faculty researchers at the Quello Center had an interest in understanding better and trying to quantify how lack of internet access affected uh, K-12 students from a grade point uh, standpoint, uh, you know, a propensity to uh, choose STEM and STEAM careers, et cetera. So, so how, does, how does that access affect the outcomes of these students uh, over their lifetime? And so we began a pilot program with, in partnership with K-12. And Joe, I think you can go to the next slide and that'll give you a nice view of kind of who we worked with on the project. We had a number of interested uh, intermediate school districts across the state and probably a working group that involved um, almost 70 organizations. Inevitably, we were only able to choose three intermediate school districts, and you see those here on the screen. They were geographically located across the state. Um, we had over 3,200 students involved, um, uh, only dealing with students uh, over age 13, um, 173 classrooms, 21 schools, and 15 districts. And Joe, if you click, what we did was we developed kind of a turnkey kit and um, you'll have to excuse my runny nose, but um, pardon me. Uh, so survey, survey in a box was essentially the approach we used and we drop mailed to each school um, where they could all deploy, you know, on uh, April 2nd, Tuesday at, at 10 a.m. They all deployed the survey within their classrooms. Um, and we tried to make it as turnkey as possible. Uh, so it was all, uh, all in a kit. And essentially what the teachers were asked to do is show a short video lesson um, on you know, broadband, what it is, um, impacts uh, of, uh, and it, it really it was um, two student groups. One had access to the internet, the other did not. And they went through an exercise and it really was a short video that um, was great for the kids to understand exactly what it is we were after with this, this survey process. So. They then completed an in-classroom survey and those with connectivity at home were sent home uh, to conduct an online survey and speed test. So um, this, this survey came at probably the end of 2019. And Joe, if you click forward, um, we, we ended collecting data probably in May of 2019 and the Quello team began to analyze those outputs and uh, again, try to quantify that impact on the students. This is a look at our online survey. And Joe, you can go ahead and click through this. And it was, um, I think March of 2020 when the formal findings were published. And this was, um, you know, the first time that this has been done in the country that we're aware of that uh, faculty researchers were able to quantify the impact of the lack of broadband has on students. So this is a look just at the breakout of students with access. So on the far right, you know, 23% of students uh, in suburbs are without access and it grows larger and larger as you move the bubbles out. So um, city, uh, city students without access was at 30% and then, rural students without access was at 47%. Um, these next two slides are really a synopsis of the impact that the Michigan State Quello team was able to quantify. So students without access to broadband in their home um, have lower GPAs overall. They ranked lower on standardized test scores, which was a, a pretty important fact that I actually left out um, when I was explaining uh, the overall methodology is that we were able to develop this um, survey ID, which allowed us to get at a household granularity level with this data, um, but then deliver the data set back to the schools in which they were able to unlock it and tie in the student test scores. Um, and uh, again, uh, I, I believe it's the only thing available in Michigan that allows us to work with this data at such a granular level, but then uh, still uh, protect the privacy, uh, which was of paramount importance, obviously, when dealing with the minors, but even, even at a, a household level and a, a county level, it's, it's still an important factor. And so we're still utilizing that methodology today with our county work. Um, so back to the students, they're light, less likely to attend college, less likely, Joe, if you want to continue uh, to choose STEM or uh, STEAM related careers. And I think the most startling outcome that we were able to uh, identify is that students with cell phone only access were worse off than students with no access at all. Wow. 
and, and Charlotte, if I if I could too, um, you know, this study again, you know, we we we've been told it's the first of its kind in the United States, quantifying the impact of the homework gap effect uh, on students and. Uh, you know, you can see that uh, it's it's very, very, very negative. And one thing that uh, we should tell people is that these faculty researchers were able to throw away all other variables. This is just the effect of lack of broadband in homes. It doesn't, it it does it uh, sort of throws out or cuts through the you know the other factors of socioeconomics and and those sorts of things. So this is just broadband's effect. Uh, and and I, I sometimes forget to tell people that, and I, I just wanted to let people know this this is uh, just the effect of the network. So Joe, if you move forward, I'll kind of talk about um, and uh, if, if folks are interested on today's uh, webinar, that is where you can find the, the formal findings published uh, through the Quello Center. So over the past six months, um, and with the onset of the pandemic, we had been through a, a number of projects after that K-12 pilot throughout the, um, you know, between 19 and 20. And when the pandemic hit, um, you know, we, we knew that there was a lot of interest and need at the county and municipal level for this type of work um, to, again, generate citizen-driven local data, accurate data on, on broadband. And the reason for that is because currently federal and state funding decisions are driven by that 477 process, which, which um, is carrier-provided data, and it's not available at a very granular, at least a household granularity, it's only at a census block level. So that is causing, obviously, census blocks to be marked as served, which in effect makes them ineligible for funding. Um, where uh, when you get down on the ground into a granular level, there are in fact homes within those census blocks that are not served. So um, the pandemic really accelerated, uh, you know, again, we knew we had this need uh, to develop this as a service and to formalize things. Um, and so we began working towards that effort. We, we really compressed that process. And in the last six months, we have been able to standardize and really create a turnkey program that provides a tremendous amount of support for local communities. Um, still allowing for flexibility, of course. Um, we standardized on our survey questions, our launch process, all of the marketing and communications planning and, um, you know, and helping uh, communities execute that plan, as well as our outputs. So um, at this point, you know, we've got a pretty healthy pipeline of, of local municipal entities that are interested in the service. And in parallel to that, we're also running this statewide viral campaign that's direct to citizens. And that's been interesting because the space merit has not, you know, we've, we've been B2B um, forever and in, in this, um, citizen campaign has certainly been a lot of fun for our marketing team. Um, and it's just creating this viral movement at the local level that's really kind of wonderful to watch. And the last thing I'll say about, about something that I think is important for this group to understand about um, just kind of looking back at our data work is what a tremendous tool this has been at a local level in order to get folks you know, organized around a common problem, committed to solving that problem together. It's just, it's creating uh, these local ecosystems through the data collection process that has been tremendous for local communities progress. All right, Joe. Um, so mean differentiators, I always like to kind of close out with these, um, uh, you know, and I, I organize these into really three categories. So, um, you know, how, how the merit process is, is differs from other data collection that's out there. Um, and that those three categories are data, um, you know, our data in fact is different in how we collect it, our collaborators, and then the community engagement and support that we provide as an r and &E. um, So in the data category, you know, we're using MLab, that's an open source platform. It focuses around user-driven data and um, our data is granular and unbiased. Um, you know, we're not coming from a point of carrier driven data, which kind of inherently creates a bias in the data and, and again, focus on, on citizen data. Our ability to survey key and get down to that granularity level yet still uh, share this data publicly without compromising identities is, is very unique. And I, I think the third thing I'll mention is um, we've developed a number of companion surveys so that we can include both served and unserved uh, populations within within our approach. So whether that be paper, uh, text survey, phone survey, um, a web, a lightweight web app, 
Um, you know, we've got a number of different methodologies developed to do the digital survey, but also make sure that we're addressing the unserved population. In the collaborator area, I've mentioned, you know, very strong collaborations with faculty researchers at MSU. And of course, MLab is the largest repository of speed tests, well-respected by the research community. Um, and so I think that's, that's definitely a differentiator. And then lastly, that community support, um, you know, we're Michigan based. And so there's um, a lot of trust that, that comes from the local communities who already have an awareness of merit as the state r &E. Um, and I think we provide really, really robust support throughout this data collection process to communities, which is why they're able to build these local ecosystems that are really the key to them taking the next steps in the journey, which are much harder than data collection as they move through feasibility, engineering, financing the network, et cetera. Joe, when you go ahead and flip. Um, I want to do a little bit of a time check uh, with Don and just see where we're at. Um, I, I do have information that's pretty interesting to share from our Washtenaw County project. We have a, com a direct 477 comparison. Um, where you, are we at with time? Well, we're, we're kind of there, but can you do it in a couple of minutes? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, Joe, uh, why don't you click to the bar slide? And Here Charlotte, I, I was going to say too, Don, you wanted us just to touch on briefly at the end, our community access network initiative, which has a direct impact on libraries too. So as Charlotte mentioned, we probably just want to show some quick samples here and then get to the CAN project as well. So Charlotte, you let me know how you'd like to advance here. If you could go to the bar chart, that's, um, well, it's, yeah, uh, it's kind of the easiest one that's, that's a summary. So this is a look at Washtenaw County uh, project that we did um, we ended in June of 2020. So we were doing data collection uh, right up until the pandemic hit. And the top bar is measuring broadband, uh, middle bar is below 25.3, but they have internet. And the lowest bar is no internet at all. And this compares the data that we found to FCC uh, coverage maps. And so in the broadband category, we were seeing a 61% differential. Um, meaning that the FCC believes that 98% of the census blocks are served within Washington County and merit data showing 37 at the, excuse me, below 25.3 level, there's a 29% differential and then no internet is lumping um, access and adoption. We've got the ability to break that out, but that's showing a 32% differential. So pretty substantial and on par with what I've heard at, at you know, the federal or the national level in terms of um, granular data versus, uh, uh, you know, uh, less granular data. Far less. <laughs> We've been going around and around on these mapping uh, issues and it just has gotten us nowhere. So thank you for picking it up. That's great. Yeah, the ultimate answer will probably be a mix of local and state and federal and who knows when we'll get there and the federal maps will be fixed, but lots of activity around that right now at both the NTIA and the FCC. Um, okay, Joe, so I do, do you want me to just give a verbal on CAN for like yeah. a one minute rundown? Um, I've, got a, this I've is, got a few slides here, yep. Okay. So um, through our moonshot work, we, uh, you know, have moved a lot and in, more into the wireless space. And as, as Jen opened up, you know, um, in piloting wireless solutions and looking at how those um, play into the mix of dealing with the pandemic and connectivity challenges. And one of which is this community access network program. Um, we launched this as a pilot. Initially, we wanted 10 sites. And the goal is to deliver uh, uh, Wi-Fi uh, to the parking lot. So Wi-Fi drive up access. Um, at schools, libraries, and community centers. And so um, through our moonshot work, we grabbed the attention of uh, the Toyota Foundation. And so we had this current pilot happening and Toyota um, uh, approached me and said, you know, we love the work you're doing. Um, we have presence within Washtenaw County um, and, and uh, our foundation has a desire to invest in these solutions. So through that, um, uh, partnership with, with the Toyota Foundation, as well as Cisco, and of course our community anchors, which included libraries, um, schools, and, and rec centers. We were able to expand this program. So Joe, if you wanna click, um, I think next is just a, a, a basic graph and of a solution diagram, and that's how things are set up. So we're using the Meraki platform for all of this, and we centrally manage the wireless environment through the Meraki cloud um, at Merit. 
And here's a, a look at our sites and, and how those lay out. So we focused on Detroit, um, Flint, and of course, Washtenaw County um, with, with our site selections. And Charlotte, I can, I just like to I'm add that. I'm not as we, good at that, Joe, so I don't, I can, I can do I'm all, you know, it's backward, it's forward, it's all over the board, you know, with me, so no worries. I did want to say that we think Merit, uh, like other RNE networks, have a unique capability to scale this sort of community access network experience. We can deliver this anywhere at any anchor institution we connect, and and it's not sort of a, you know, a unique to that institution. You know, small anchors are already stressed by not having enough staff and, you know, it's tough to deliver services. And here back at the, the corporate headquarters or network operations center, we can manage all these wireless sites ourselves consistently. And as Charlotte uh, showed on the diagram, we've got video cameras. So if, if an organization wants to turn a video camera on so we can see how it's doing for security purposes, we can. Not all want that, obviously, since privacy can be a concern. But we feel if this takes off, that this actually could be a service we delivered either through you know, direct service relationships with these anchors, where we would turn up uh, public Wi-Fi sites, or uh, philanthropically funded uh, you know, <clears throat> techniques as well. So. We think this is great. You can see how, how quickly this has all grown. And again, having corporate philanthropy to, to benefit the program, at least in its pretty big startup phase is, uh, is cool. And Charlotte has just been, you know, knocking it out of the park, gaining these relationships and our tech team, man, they, they love this new stuff. And the, the great thing about it is we, we can scale it. We've got very little overhead to manage this across the entire state if we wanted to. So that's kind of the, you know, from, from the CEO standpoint, this is a service that can really scale, be consistent and help our anchors out. Joe, this is fantastic. Charlotte, thank you so much. I also see you've got the uh, Celine District Library on your chart there. And that, uh, that project, happily, we as Gabriel Libraries were able to support that through uh, current IMLS uh, grant uh, for Community Second Nets, which you've touched on so many of the points of that, extending access, is a response in a disaster scenario, uh, the redundancy of these wireless connections, all of that, Joe. You, this is this is just an outstanding project, and I and I really think you're onto something, and I think people are going to replicate that. <clears throat> it embodies this uh, this to and through concept that we've been talking about. You know, you know, fiber to the anchor, wireless through, you know, all kind of ways. But the service is mainly the thing we're talking about, <clears throat> and that. Rather than just thinking of anchors as endpoints, we can think of them as intermediate endpoints. They are both endpoints, and then they can be uh, uh, hubs to extend services to obviously the, the patrons and, and citizens and students in their communities. So the, the thing that struck me was uh, your recurring uh, emphasis on ecosystem. And I think that's a really powerful idea that we can't just separate the network from everything else. It can't just be sort of a business model that pushes, you know, wires and, and towers around out in the, out in the, uh, uh, the countryside, depending on, you know, the measured demand. It's, it's an all in, this is infrastructure. This is an all in kind of a thing where the stakeholders have to be involved in planning. Uh, uh, we, we've been long making the point that every community should have a strategy for its communications infrastructure. Whatever business model, whatever technology, you know, figure that part out, but just understand how important this is to the future of your community and having a partner like Merit to work with to develop those kinds of ideas and plans just couldn't be, couldn't be better situation. I did have one question for you, Joe. Uh, you mentioned, uh, besides the stunning statistic that cell phone only connections is worse than no connection for the outcome. That's just that's horrendous, basically. But I had a question. You mentioned commodity internet. Could you kind of explain what that is and how it may or may not be what Merit offers or the RENs yeah. in general? Yeah, sure, Don. Uh, you know, some, some RENs prefer to be the transport vehicle for internet service that their own members procure and then deliver over that private network. Um, and, and, you know, that's a fine approach. It has some advantages, certainly, and just focusing on what I'll call the, 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 the second layer of the internet, which is really the big pipes to allow organizations to get the internet service from whatever provider they want and then deliver that. So it's, it's different, you know, commodity internet service is what, you know, kind of like the service you get at your home. It's end-to-end -end service, access to the broader internet. 
Uh, some RENs prefer not to do that and leave that to you know others and competitive processes. Merit is a player uh, in this area. We feel we're able to aggregate and lower costs. You know, we don't win every bid, trust me. Uh, there's a lot of uh, big ISPs and uh, network companies that can do better on price than we can. But the good news is we're in there swinging, driving those prices down too and, and helping force some of that competition, which is great. We don't mind at all. You know, it's, uh, again, that ecosystem theme that you mentioned is important to Merit. We have some very good relationships with telecommunication providers. Uh, they, we can't do our work without some of them. They can't do their work without some of us. So it's, you know, this ecosystem is includes vendors and most importantly for Merit, our community, right? We have some incredible technology experts in libraries and K through 12 and universities certainly. And we're taking all this knowledge and creating better solutions for the community. One of the things I didn't mention is we've, we've got these communities of practice where experts come together and we talk about security services, IT leadership uh, innovation, uh, network services, of course. And, you know, we just feel we're, we're pushing the envelope here in Michigan through that uh, community of practice and community collaboration. Outstanding. And, and you certainly make the point for alternatives, for competitive uh, environments to drive down prices, to drive up quality of service. And uh, this is an incredibly important role that the RENs play in the wider ecosystem to, to do that on behalf of the, the stakeholders in their state. So uh, thanks for this. I, we've, we are running over our hour, it's okay. But I think this would be a good point to uh, close the recording. We'll hang around for a little while as we usually do for kind of open discussion. Uh, and so, uh, before before we close formally, I'd like to ask everybody to unmute, please unmute your your mics, if you would, please, because we'd like to uh, formally thank our speakers, Jan and Charlotte and Joe. Please, a little applause. Thank you. Yeah, great. Hey, hey, Aloha. Thank you, Don. Okay. Thank you all. All right, Stephen.